I'm delighted to see so many people here. I'm Paul Carice. I'm the director of this new school, as you can see from our banners, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership here at Arizona State University. Welcome to our second annual conference as part of our second annual major speaker series. And the theme this year, as you know, is polarization and civil disagreement confronting America's uh, civic crisis. On behalf of the faculty and the staff team who have been working on this event um, for months, uh, thank you all of you for uh, coming, especially our speakers, um, many of whom have come from quite far away. We have a terrific conversation to have unfolding in front of you uh, and that you can participate in uh, over the next day and a half. Uh, the purpose of our speaker series since September um, has been to have a very high-level public dialogue open to all members of the ASU community and, and the uh, Phoenix area uh, about what polarization is, in what way it is a civic crisis uh, for America, challenging our capacity for self-government to address causes. And then I'm, I, I put a challenge to the speakers we have today to particularly spend time on addressing remedies. What, what could be done in academia, uh, those who are writers, uh, public intellectuals, journalists in the media, uh, in, in other institutions of uh, civil society. Uh, the school, uh, I'll just briefly introduce, is a uh, new project from the state government in Arizona and from Arizona State University to bring together two modes of education that really have been separated, we think, in higher education in the last 50 years or so. Liberal education or liberal arts education and civic education. So in our undergraduate curriculum, our major and our minor, we're trying to reconnect those. We also are beginning to work with the K-12 public schools and the State Department of Education on civic education in uh, especially the middle school and high school level. Um, one other initiative I want to mention before I, I uh, introduce our, our uh, first keynote speaker is that we have a new uh, board of counselors to assist the school. So this school was uh, uh, a project from the state legislature, the president of the university, down to my dean, the College of Arts and Sciences dean. He developed a very distinguished board of scholars from uh, Stanford University, Harvard University, Notre Dame, uh, Arthur Brooks uh, in, a, in a role from, from AEI uh, to help design the concept and the curriculum of the school. And we're, um, several members of that advisory board are here and will be speaking on the program. Catherine Zuckert is with us this semester as a visiting uh, professor. And then in the past few months, we thought we needed another advisory board of a different sort to play a different role. Experienced leaders in civic and political life uh, to advise us on civic education and, and particularly on this theme that we're discussing this year about civil discourse, restoring constructive disagreement. Uh, so I'm delighted to be able to announce that Senator John Kyle and Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, former Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, have agreed to co-chair that national board of counselors, and then we'll be announcing uh, soon the other members of that board. So there should be information outside. We always have information outside about the school, its curriculum, our, our programs. Um, and as you can see uh, from the cameras, Arizona PBS has been a partner the past two years in our major public affairs series. So everything's recorded and is eventually available on the PBS website and on our website, and, and uh, Arizona PBS broadcasts uh, shorter versions of our speaker events. So now to our uh, first um, keynote speaker, um, Jonathan Rausch, who is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's the author of six books and many articles on public policy, but also American culture and government. He is a contributing editor uh, to The Atlantic. Uh, uh, we happen to have Steve Clemens, the Washington editor of The Atlantic here, who just wanted to come to town to keep an eye on Jonathan, I think. Uh, uh, his most recent book is, uh, Jonathan's most recent book is The Happiness Curve, Why Life Gets Better After 50. Um, he's an, an award-winning uh, author. He was uh, including the 2005 National Magazine Award. Um, and uh, his... Uh, column called Social Studies appeared from 1998 to 2010 in National Journal. One reason I suggested uh, to Dr. Carol McNamara, our organizer of, of public programs, that we should bring um, Jonathan here is his 
his article from the Atlantic, which then he turned into a, a, um, an e-book in 2015 about political realism, uh, making a case for why certain kinds of reforms to clean up politics and make politics more democratic had actually weakened uh, American democracy. So with that, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Rauch. Wow, what an honor to be here um, and to see so many colleagues and, and friends. Uh, and what an extraordinary cast. Only ASU could bring together a cast like this for a weekend. So I am deeply privileged to be part of this today. I'm also happy to be back in my hometown. I grew up about seven miles north of here on the desert. And as unpleasant as this weather may seem to you, if you grew up on the desert as a desert rat, you know that rain of the kind we saw today on the desert is a very special occasion and a cause actually for great celebration. So let's take it as a good omen. I'll be with you for about the next 50 minutes, um, and then we'll have a conversation, and I hope it will be a conversation, because the people in this room know a great deal about more about many aspects of this subject than I do. In May of 2016, a motorist named Cassie McWade had an accident on the interstate in western North Carolina and called her mechanic for a tow. Her mechanic couldn't come, so he called another company, and in due course, a man named Ken Shoup of Shoopy Max Towing reached her. But as he began preparing to tow her car, he noticed a Bernie Sanders sticker on her bumper. Shoup was a Trump supporter. He told McQuaid that he would not accept her business, suggested by one account that she called the government for help and drove away. I'm really not interested in doing business with that kind of clientele, he later told the local TV news station. Asked if he thought it was fair to leave a motorist stranded, he replied, it's not fair, but it's the norm nowadays. This is the world we live in. Just so, indeed, it's the norm nowadays. It's the world we live in. Polarization has become its own justification. In the spring of 2018, a poll by the Pew Research Center registered yet another marker in the long series of milestones on the road to ungovernability. Democrats are now just as averse to compromise as Republicans, only a minority in both parties, 46% of Democrats, 44% of Republicans told Pew that they like elected officials who make compromises with people they disagree with. The essence of the US Constitution, of course, is to require compromise as a condition of governing. In rejecting compromise, Americans are rejecting governance. The United States and other countries have been down that road before, and the results are never good. My talk this morning, which I call Rethinking Polarization, How a Tough Problem Became Tougher, represents at least my attempt to understand better what polarization entails in today's America, how to assess it, and how, uh, if, any, if, if anything, what to do about it. There's a vast political science literature on the subject, much of it authored by people in this room. I will allude to some of it, but make no attempt to survey it or assess it. Rather, I'll ask you to join me in rethinking a subject which has engaged me for years as a journalist covering government and as a think tanker at Brookings, where I'm a senior fellow, analyzing it. A lot of new light has been cast on the subject in the past few years, and unfortunately, it's not a flattering light. In 2005, writing for The Atlantic, I took a hard look at polarization, which was then a fast emerging issue. In those days, as today, everyone agreed on some important trends. In Congress, party-line polarization, commonly called partisanship, had risen steadily since the mid-1970s. Centrist members of Congress, always vulnerable in their string districts, swing districts, were being washed away. Gerrymandering contributed to the trend, but the same pattern prevailed in the Senate, which, of course, by definition is not gerrymandered. In Congress, party-line voting had become the, uh, the norm, there was little ideological overlap between the two parties. The political class's middle was steadily hollowing out, and all of those trends were evident a decade ago and have progressed in a mostly linear fashion since then. Um, 
Elite polarization had happened in both parties, but it was not symmetrical. Republicans had veered farther to the right than Democrats had to the left. More controversial in the 2000s was whether polarization was a popular phenomenon as well as an elite phenomenon. Some political scientists, such as Alan Abramowitz of Emory, marshaled evidence showing that support in the electorate for relatively centrist positions was shrinking. Another school, led by Stanford's Mo Fiorina, who's with us today, argued that the ideological center had shrunk, but not all that much, and that lots of Americans still agreed on many issues. The big change, he said, was that parties, which had once been ideologically diverse coalitions, have sorted themselves out on ideological lines and offer increasingly extreme candidates to the voters. Everyone in those days agreed that both kinds of changes in the makeup of the parties and the ideologies of the partisans have happened, and that both create challenges for governing. But the relative emphases mattered. If America is becoming a nation of extremists, then governability is going to grow harder. If, on the other hand, parties are becoming more ideologically distinct and coherent, well, that could have an upside. There was, and there still is, a case for parties with defined points of view, even if that translates sometimes into roadside intolerance. In 1950, as you all know, a task force of the American Political Science Association famously declared that America's two parties were, in effect, insufficiently polarized. Called toward a more responsible two-party system, the task force argued that the party's philosophical incoherence blurred choices and accountability. In 1990, when I studied the political system in Japan, a common complaint, and one which I subscribed to, was that Japan's ideologically piebald political factions had emptied elections of meaningful choices, and therefore provided too little guidance for policy. Disagreement characterizes the world we live in, as the tow truck driver said, and a healthy political system surfaces conflict instead of suppressing it. Those then were the general parameters of the conversation about a decade ago, before the Great Recession, Sarah Palin, Bernie Sanders, the Tea Party, Black Lives Matter, the Freedom Caucus, and of course, President Donald J. Trump. Today, the questions which preoccupied us back then remain very relevant, but in important respects, they have been subsumed by another set of questions. What we mean today by polarization and what we meant then are not the same. I'll begin explaining that statement by noticing that what Fiorina said more than a decade ago is still true. The ideological center has shrunk, but not by any means disappeared. On most issue, issues, as Professor Fiorina wrote in 2014, attitudes continue to cluster in the middle. Still, the center continues to erode. In his analysis of American national election studies data, Abramowitz finds that the share of all voters placing themselves in the center of the ideological scale, or unable to place themselves, fell from 49% in 1972 to 35% in 2012. According to Pew, the share of Americans who take mixed ideological positions rather than being consistent conservatives or liberals stood at 39% in 2014, down 10 points from the level as recently as 2004. If party sorting has slowed, it's only because both parties are too pure to be sorted much further. Geographical sorting, meanwhile, amplifies the effects of party sorting. As of 2016, about 60% of Americans live in so-called landslide counties, where either Trump or Hillary Clinton received at least 60% of the major party vote. The comparable figure was 50% in 2012 and about 40% in 1992. Moreover, the center today punches below its weight politically. The more consistently ideological and extreme an American is, the more likely he or she is to vote and make political contributions. Discouraged centrists and moderates increasingly perceive elective office as a hostile environment for people like themselves and are reluctant to run for Congress and state legislatures, making the, government in the governing environment even more hostile to centrists and moderates and depriving moderate voters of the opportunity to vote for compromise-minded candidates. 
Now, in all of those respects, to repeat, the trends of the past few years have been more or less linear. So what is the more fundamental change I alluded to? Consider the Pew figure that I cited just now, finding that 39% of Americans take mixed ideological positions. Peek beneath the surface of that number, and you find that many of those 39% are not ideologically moderate, they are ideologically mixed up. In many cases, they hold an eclectic assortment of extreme positions. Something analogous is also true of the political parties. Assuredly, the Democrats and Republicans are much more purely left-wing and right-wing, respectively, than 50 years ago. Certainly, Republicans are more hostile to government than are Democrats. Ideologically, the parties stand on opposite shores, but they are still far from internally coherent in any philosophical sense. Democrats are divided between market-oriented technocrats and out-and-out -out socialists. Republicans are in the grip of a populist takeover that defies the relatively libertarian internationalist orthodoxy of their heretofore dominant Reaganite wing. Are the Democrats center-left or socialist? Are the Republicans populist or libertarian? Both and both. We are not seeing a hardening of coherent ideological difference. We're seeing a hardening of incoherent ideological difference. No question, the partisan divide has widened by more than 20 points since 1994, according to Pew's measure. Yet according to Pew, over the same period, if you slice Americans, not by party affiliation, but by, for example, race, religious attendance, education, or gender, you find that polarization is neither large nor growing. To put this another way, America is not growing more divided on every dimension. Blacks have not parted ways from whites, or women from men, or college graduates from non-college graduates. The growing and now gaping divide is specifically partisan. And the growth in partisanship does not reflect a clear or clean ideological divide. First and foremost, the increase in partisanship reflects, well, an increase in partisanship. Here we reach an interesting, if somewhat surreal question. What if, to some extent, the increase in partisanship is not really about anything? To put the point in a less Zen way, what if tribalism, not ideological disagreement, is behind the rise of polarization? What if emotional identification with a partisan team is driving ideological identification rather than the other way around? To understand and assess that peculiar proposition, we need to expand our compass beyond classical political science and into realms of social and cognitive psychology. For increasingly, it appears that a decade and more ago, I and others were barking up the wrong tree. We were looking for changes in ideology when what were more important are changes in feelings. Several research developments have brought about that reassessment. One of those is the growing awareness of affective polarization. This measures not differences in what partisans believe, but differences in their subjective feelings toward one another. On that score, the news is pretty grim. As Pew commented in 2014, the share of Republicans who have very unfavorable opinions of the Democratic Party has jumped from 17% to 43% in the last 20 years. Similarly, the share of Democrats with a very negative opinion of the Republican Party has also more than doubled. But these numbers tell only part of the story. Among Republicans and Democrats who have a very unfavorable impression of the other party, the vast majority say the opposing party's policies represent a threat to the nation's well-being. Abramowitz finds that this affective polarization has grown faster than issue polarization, although the two are clearly intertwined. At least there is something that both sides agree on, namely that they can't agree. In Pew's polling large majorities, more than three quarters of respondents in both parties concur that Republican and Democratic voters can't even agree on basic facts. 
Something else that they agree on, in 2016, according to Pew, majorities of highly politically engaged Republicans and highly politically engaged Democrats said that the other party makes them feel afraid. Now think about that for a minute. When one ponders those and other such findings, one is forced to reflect that the word hate might be too strong, but it is, alas, in the right general ballpark for inter-party feeling right now. What we fear, we also tend to hate. A second related development is that of negative partisanship. It's not so much that we like our own party as that we detest the other party. In fact, Eric Gronendick of the University of Memphis finds evidence that people hate the other part party partially because they are disappointed in their own party. He says, they appear to be rationalizing continued identification with their party in the face of this ambivalence by reporting even more negative attitudes toward the other party. In other words, they seem to be engaging in the lesser of two evils identity defense. By protecting their own sense of belonging, that is intense partisan animosity performs what Gronendig calls emotional rescue. The fevered view of President Obama pr proffered by people like Dinesh D'Souza may have been absurd, but it did serve the purpose of making every Republican leader look better by comparison. If Nancy Pelosi is the devil incarnate, then you had better support whatever mediocre Republican is on offer. In any case, an implication of negative partisanship is that partisans are not so much rallying for a cause or party they believe in as they are banding together to fight a collective enemy, psychologically and politically, a very different kind of proposition, as we see when we look at the literature on what tribalism does to the brain. Humans are designed to be tribal. We are wired to organize ourselves socially into in-groups, our own group, and out-groups, others' groups. And we are wired to organize ourselves cognitively so that our reasoning processes and even our sensory perceptions support in-group solidarity. Believing is belonging, as the social psychology phrase goes, a generalization now backed by wide-ranging an impressive research literature based on everything from controlled experiments to brain scans. Fans of opposing sports teams perceive different events in close calls. Fans of opposing political parties perceive different facts and take different policy views depending on which party lines up on which side. Presenting people with facts that challenge an identity or group defining opinion does not work. Instead of changing their mind, people often will reject the facts and double down on their false belief. This is true regardless of educational and cognitive firepower. In fact, super smart people use their big brains to perform somersaulting rationalizations. Um, extreme partisanship may be literally addictive, writes the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt. Partisans who find ways to rationalize their beliefs get a little hit of dopamine he says, like rats that cannot stop pressing a button, partisans may be simply unable to stop believing weird things. I could go on in the same vein. To some considerable extent, what we're calling polarization in the United States seems not to be ideological or even rational. We may rationalize it on ideological grounds and it may drive us toward ideological discord, but what we are in fact doing is satisfying a deep atavistic craving, to belong to an in-group, and to bind ourselves to a group by feeling and displaying animosity toward an out-group. If group solidarity requires us to perform a 180 degree reversal on, say, free trade, or immigration, or Russia, or North Korea, or military action in Syria, we will flip and then rationalize the reversal. If group solidarity requires us to excuse Donald Trump for behaviors far worse than those we condemned in Bill Clinton, no problem. To paraphrase that great political sage Groucho Marx, we have our principles, but if our in-group doesn't like those principles, well, we have other principles. That was for you, Bill Galston. At this point, it probably goes without saying that the themes Trump ran and won on in 2016 and the themes that he governs on are short on philosophical coherence. But they have a deeper psychological 
coherence. Trump's appeals to ethnic and racial resentment, his portrayals of a country and culture under siege, and his populist demonization of multiple enemies offered Republicans something more appealing than any particular set of policies. They offered solidarity against a threat. On this reading, Trump may have secured his initial foothold by catering to the George Wallace portion of the party. But the remainder of the party did not rally to Trump because it embraced his message. It embraced his message in order to rally to Trump. He offered a vivid us versus them story that energized one portion of the party and then once his followers redefined what we, the in-group, believe, the rest of the party preserved its identity by scrambling aboard although the result was to reverse Republican orthodoxy on everything from entitlement spending and trade protectionism to global alliances and the FBI, partisans felt no psychological inconsistency or lurch because as a result of their ideological somersaults, they continued to be aligned with the same in-group and opposed to the same out-group. On this interpretation, the Republican base, or at least some large portion of it, likes Trump precisely because the Democratic base hates him. Polarization is not a byproduct of his policies and rhetoric. Polarization is the product. His provocations and the other team's reactions scratch partisans' craving for shared outrage against a common adversary. Within certain fairly broad boundaries, he was free to offer all sorts of policies successfully and possibly to shoot someone on Fifth Avenue as long as he provoked outrage from the other side in trollees, triggered the libtards, he would elicit protective loyalty from his own side. In that respect, Trump is not a political genius, but merely a garden variety demagogue, pressing buttons that politicians have manipulated since Alcibiades. Talking about school choice or trade adjustment assessment or, or vocational education or other ways to help the working class might be well and good, but the public's collective amygdala craved something more like WWE wrestling, an us versus them, good versus evil drama where you can stand on a chair and yell your guts out. I am not saying that ideology plays no role in partisanship. The ideological and partisan gaps have both increased and they are hard to disentangle. The research by Liliana Mason finds interestingly that Quoting here, the effect of issue-based ideology is less than half the size of identity-based ideology in driving effective polarization. Nor am I saying that reason is inconsequential and we're always slaves of tribalism. As you'll see, I'll argue the opposite. And I may be guilty of exaggerating to make a point, but at a minimum, I think I can confidently say this. What we have learned from both academic research and real world politics over the past few years is that a purely political or ideological account of polarization is incomplete. We are up against a kind of tribalism here that is deeper and tougher than we used to imagine. It's a powerful source of political energy and demagogues in the United States and around the world are plugging into that source of energy. One of the most important characteristics of this new form of polarization is that there is nothing new about it. Tribalism has been the prevalent mode of social organization for all but approximately the most recent 2% of human span on the planet. What needs explaining actually is first, why it should be asserting itself so powerfully now after decades of relative dormancy, and second, why our standard means of containing it seem to be failing. As to the first question, why so much tribalism right now? Well, the causes are, as social scientists say, overdetermined. There is no shortage of reasons why public demand for effective polarization might have increased. Among those commonly cited, just to tick off some, the decline of civic organizations, like unions and clubs, reduces individual sense of connectedness and agency pardon me, stagnant wage growth for the less educated causes disappointment and resentment. The declining hold of religion, organized religion, and especially the collapse of mainline Protestant denominations have replaced apocalyptic and redemptive, I'm sorry, have displaced apocalyptic and redemptive impulses into politics where they don't belong. 
Identity politics on the left and market fundamentalism on the right erode the feeling of shared citizenship and identity. Changing demographics and high penetration by immigrants inspire fears of economic and cultural displacement among rights. The decline of traditional masculine jobs and social roles leaves working class men feeling emasculated and marginalized. The fragmenting of media isolates more of us in separate information bubbles. Algorithm, pardon me, algorithmic social media platforms provide a lucrative business model for viral outrage, the flowering of lifestyle diversity and consumer choice makes social differences more obvious. I don't know how to evaluate the relative or absolute merits of those and other contributors to tribalization. So I'll just say, take your pick and add your own. The common theme in any case is that humans were designed for life in small homogeneous groups where change was slow and choices were few. And if we find ourselves living in large heterogeneous populations with bewilderingly many choices and fast paced change, we may be more apt to build a tribal cocoon for ourselves, a form of emotional rescue, to use Gronendijk's term, which partisan polarization may provide. That may help explain the growing demand for polarization, but what about our defenses? They are many and diverse. Um, but a good way to think about them can be found in an important speech that Jonathan Haidt gave in 2017 for the Manhattan Institute. He argues, here I paraphrase loosely, my words not his, that it is difficult for tribalistic humans to run and sustain a modern liberal society founded on compromise, toleration, and impersonal rules of institutions. Doing so requires us to function at far above our design specifications. Pulling it off requires getting a lot of social settings just right. Those settings include formal laws like the US Constitution, informal norms like law abidingness and truthfulness, rule-based institutions like free markets and elections, a system of education which inculcates liberal values, and public mores which honor and defend those liberal values. These social arrangements can contain naked tribalism by appealing to competing values and by offering us a better deal. If I master my tribal impulses and follow liberal norms, others will do the same and we can all enjoy more peace, prosperity, and fairness than any tribal chief or deity could ever provide. The golden rule, Locke's social contract theory, Smith's invisible hand, Kant's categorical imperative, Mill's case for intellectual freedom, marketplace of ideas, Rawls' veil of ignorance, the US Constitution's balancing of contending factions and powers, all in their various ways demand that we set parochialism aside and entrust our fates to, ab to abstract rules and distant authorities on the condition that others will do the same. Over the course of the centuries, we gradually came to take the liberal settings for granted, but that turns out to be a mistake. Throughout history and also throughout the world today, very few societies, relatively speaking, have managed to overcome winner-take-all tribalism. And in America recently, we have taken a lot of liberties with the settings. In politics, we've shunted aside the gatekeepers and institutions that screened out sociopathic politicians before they reached the ballot. In civic life, we've succumbed to, I would argue, in fact, we have valorized cynicism about core institutions. In education, elite universities frequently encourage students to burrow into their tribal identities rather than to transcend them. In media, new technologies enable and monetize outrage and extremism. In the realm of social mores, norms like forbearance, truth-telling, and respect for law have come under attack, generally for financial or political profit. Those and other social settings began to drift long before Trump. Again, there is no shortage of candidates for blame. Again, most share a common theme. Denigrating and weakening liberal values and institutions increases the fear that we cannot live with one another peaceably and thus raises the perceived level of threat. When the conservative activist Grover Norquist asserts that if more states adopt right to work laws, and I quote, the modern Democratic Party will cease to be a competitive power in American politics, he is proposing not to come to terms with the other side, but to eradicate it. The other side responds just as fearfully as one would expect. 
Fear is radicalizing, and for the many entrepreneurial activists, politicians, and celebrities who cultivate fear, radicalism is personally and politically profitable. The founders were well aware of the dangers of populism, demagoguery, faction. They built a constitutional order designed to force compromise and impede sociopathic behavior. But the institutions they put in place as gatekeepers, political bosses, smoke-filled room, I'm sorry, the, the Electoral College, the appointed Senate, the formal institutions became obsolete, and the successor gatekeepers, political bosses, smoke-filled rooms, big media, came to seem undemocratic and lost their grip. Today, the road to power for a sociopath or demagogue is comparatively unobstructed. As a result, the fail-safes designed to protect the system when the settings go out of adjustment have themselves begun to fail. Back then to polarization as such. Increasingly, partisan disagreement is rooted not in policy disagreement, but in a sense of threat, a sense gleefully amplified by demagogues. If the other side wins, my side's lifestyles, my values, my very ability to exist will hang by a thread. Thus the meme of the Flight 93 election, or the notion that Hillary Clinton's election would drive Christianity from the public square. Hogwash, but perfect for inspiring apocalyptic fear. Quite reasonably, and also inevitably, when Democrats see Republicans talking apocalyptically, they circle their own wagons. They arm for war. Politics becomes a zero-sum conflict or a negative-sum conflict. Norms and constraints go out the window. Every available tool and technique is weaponized. In that respect, the kind of polarization we're seeing now is not political so much as, if you will, anti-political. It is certainly not what the American Political Science Association task force had in mind when it called for parties to develop more distinct and coherent policy positions. Here is something to know in the current situation. If liberal settings like institutions, norms, trust, and social cooperation can be maladjusted, they can also be readjusted. We know this is so because multiple countries around the world have in fact established durable and successful liberal regimes, regimes which have withstood seemingly overwhelming challenges. Americans have seen severe tribalism in the past, in the early 1800s between Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, in the 1820s and 1830s between Jacksonians and Whigs, in the 1850s, of course, between the North and the South, and in the civil rights conflict of mid 20th century. Yet the country has succeeded in re-equilibrating. In today's situation, general, uh, generational change may help because millennials seem less oriented towards self-righteous conflict than does my generation, baby boom. Fatigue might also help. A high conflict society is an exhausting and nasty place to live, which is why liberalism was invented in the first place. Also, important, collectively and individually, we can choose. Earlier, I emphasized the pre-rational, wired-in nature of human tribalism. We are what we are, yet human societies are plastic, and they can be shaped by voluntary choices, choices in turn shaped by reason and goodwill and institutional design. Unlike our apish ancestors, modern Americans can make decisions about our lives and our polity, and those decisions will make a difference. As Haidt has said, tribalism may be pre-wired, but it is not hardwired. Lots of people are feeling alarmed by the polarization industry and are getting fed up with it. Many are becoming aware that their buttons are being pushed and their brains are being hacked. More are resolving to do something about it by forming civic efforts with names like Bridge the Divide, Bridge USA, Living Room Conversations, the Listen First Project. I happen to be involved in one such effort. It's called Better Angels. I sit on its board, as does Jonathan Haidt, the social psychologist who I've mentioned a number of times. What started as a few workshops in a handful of communities uh, between red voters and blue voters has blossomed into a rapidly growing national grassroots movement whose declared mission is to depolarize America. Um, in structured hour-long encounters, Republicans and Democrats meet to listen to each other and to find civic commonality, not, mind you, to agree on issues. The goal is to reduce affective polarization 
by seeing the folks across the divide as sympathetic and human and not as some kind of beastly other. This can be done, psychologists have found, by getting diverse and disagreeing individuals, not just in a room together. That doesn't work, but getting them to work together on a common project as a team. And it turns out that reducing polarization within the group can itself be such a project. Moreover, recent research finds that people overestimate the emotional cost of disagreement. When they actually engage others face to face, the encounter is usually more pleasant than they expect. For both of those reasons, participants in Better Angels workshops often find the sessions morally and emotionally reparative. Frequently, they maintain the transpartisan relationships they build and they sign up to propagate the project by taking it to new communities or training to become moderators themselves. If polarization can bootstrap itself, so it turns out can depolarization. The point I want to make here is not that a single organization or effort can turn polarization around. Rather, that a growing number of such efforts can make a difference in several ways. One, of course, is by reducing animosity and opening communication between individuals. Another, however, which may be more important, is challenging the narrative of helplessness. Participants in Better Angels workshops leave the room feeling there is something they can do. They feel empowered to improve the affective climate, if not in the whole country, then at least in their own lives and their own communities. As we know from Tocqueville, when Americans set about to raise a roof or build a civic group, there is not much they cannot do. An even more important way, I think, to rebuild interpersonal connections is by strengthening institutions. Most people think little about institutions in the context of polarization. In fact, most Americans nowadays think little about institutions at all. But I think rebuilding institutions and thinking more institutionally are the most important pieces of the puzzle. In three recent lectures at Princeton University, Yuval Levin, a conservative writer and scholar who we're honored to have with us today, makes a profound and compelling case for institutions. Both the public's loss of confidence in institutions and its neglect even to think about them, he argues, have left a gap in American everyday life that causes anime and frustration and makes problems difficult to solve. Our society is in need of something that it lacks but isn't asking for, he says. What we're missing, although we too rarely put it this way, is not simply connectedness but a structure of social life, a way to give shape and purpose, concrete meaning and identity, to the things we do together. By institutions, Yuval means broadly, the durable forms of our associational life, the forms and structures of what we do together. Their weakening makes everything else more difficult. True, he notes society faced, uh, faces many challenges today, but not exceptional ones. Again, Yuval will forgive me for quoting him at some length, he writes, what does stand out about our time is not the strength of these pressures, but the weakness of our institutions from the family on up through the national government with lots in between, which leaves us less able to handle the pressures and to hold together. And it leaves us with something more like formless connectedness, a social life without structural supports, which can work fine for people with lots of social capital to spend, but doesn't work nearly as well for those who need to build their stock of it. Yuval does not take up the problem of polarization specifically in those lectures that he made tonight, but his point certainly applies. In many respects, institutions are enemies of tribalism, at least in the context of a liberal society. By definition, institutions bring people together for joint effort or common projects, which builds community. They also socialize individuals and transmit knowledge and norms across generations. Because they are durable, or at least seek to be, they tend to take a longer view and discourage behavior that considers only self-interest in the very short term. Because they try to force individuals to consult with others before making decisions, and then they hold them accountable afterwards, they're good at filtering and correcting the cognitive distortions to which we're all subject as individuals. Under many conditions, they can provide stability and resources to buffer the shocks of economic and social disruption. And by organizing collective effort, 
they make people much more efficacious, which increases people's sense of agency and dignity. Think about how membership in the Boy Scouts, the Kiwanis Club, the American Bar Association, or the military, churches, synagogues, other religious organizations. Think about how those form us as individuals, connect us with others, build our communities, establish norms that define us. In all of those ways and others, human institutions were the breakthrough technology that freed homo sapiens from our tribal chains. Of course, of course, institutions can act parochially, antisocially, oppressively, tribally. They can themselves be captured by tribalism. They need oversight and healthy competition. All of that is true. I believe, though, that Yuval is right. When we begin to treat institutions as obstacles to personal fulfillment and sweep them aside in an access of democratizing zeal, they are replaced not by, say, wondrous social networks that connect and pacify the entire world, but by atomization, inefficaciousness, and vulnerability, which in turn breed fear and hostility. It is no coincidence that Donald Trump and his ilk seek to denigrate and disempower institutions at every turn. Strong institutions stand in sociopaths way, and weak ones smooth the path to demagoguery. I agree with my colleague Bill Galston and others who have argued that reducing polarization and the appeal of illiberalism will require measures to reduce stress on the millions who feel left behind by today's global whirlwind of change. But I think rebuilding institutions, and just as important, noticing and valuing institutions, is even more important for containing tribalism. And two institutions in particular deserve strengthening, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. What? I hear the laughter. Aren't they the very font of partisan polarization? Actually, no. Paradoxically, partisanship has never been stronger, but the party organizations have never been weaker. And this is, in fact, not a paradox at all. When they had the capacity to do so, party organizations engaged citizens in volunteer work, local party clubs, and social events, giving ordinary people a sense of political engagement, which merely voting or writing a check cannot provide. Until they lost the power to do so, they road tested and vetted political candidates, screening out incompetence, sociopaths, charlatans, and those with no interest in governing. When they could, they used incentives like jobs and money and protection for primary challenges to get legislators to work together and accept tough compromises. Perversely, the weakening of parties as organizations has led individuals to coalesce instead around parties as brands, turning organizational politics into identity politics. To put the point another way, the more parties weaken as institutions, whose members are united by loyalty to their organization, the more they are strengthened as tribes, whose members are united by hostility toward their enemy, whether real, exaggerated, or invented. In that respect, polarization is called upon to provide solidarity when institutions cannot. If we cannot create institutions, we will instead create bogeyman. In our anti-party, anti-institutional environment, none of that can easily be turned around. Still, a growing contingent of political thinkers, among whom I count myself, believe that strengthening parties as institutions, as organizations, is possible and beneficial. At a minimum, rethinking the past four decades of single-minded pursuit of an ever more individualistic and consumeristic politics is essential. So where does that leave us? In a swamp, but with a path out. We cannot change human nature. We are stuck with our Serengeti evolved selves. But we are rational creatures. We're capable of analyzing and understanding the forces which beset us, and then capable of acting. Getting traction against effective polarization and tribalism will require some direct measures, such as civic bridge building. Even more, it will require indirect measures, such as strengthening institutions like unions, civic clubs, political party organizations, civics, education, religious groups, and others. Above all, it will require renorming, rediscovering, and recommitting to virtues like lawfulness and truthfulness and forbearance and compromise. 
Now to cite a real authority. If, like me, you believe that the wellspring of modern day wisdom is Star Trek, I refer, of course, to the original series. You may recall a third season episode called Day of the Dove. In it, humans and Klingons engage in an escalating conflict aboard the Enterprise, but then the humans discover that the ship has been invaded by an alien that stimulates both sides' aggression in order to feed off their animosity. Does that sound familiar? By calling a truce, the combatants starve the alien and drive it from the ship. Actually, it's a pretty darn good analogy. First, understanding and awareness. Then, building personal and community connections. Then, rebuilding social norms and institutions. Those are the steps toward depolarization, and we have lots of history to tell us they can work. No guarantees are on offer, of course, but no new technology is needed either. And perversely, by the sheer crudity of their attacks and the sheer baldness of their sociopathy, Trump and his troll army may end up strengthening liberal norms and institutions by scaring us at last into defending them. Thank you. So conversation. Yes, we have time. Uh, and not Q&A because you all are more qualified than I am. And there's a microphone in the middle. Welcome to pose brief questions. Our general rule is uh, please try to be brief and make it a question. I started homeschooling about 23 years ago. Wow before the internet. And at the time, we would communicate through the mail. We would get together in groups. We would have discussions. We would be an institution, in a sense. And I led a group of about 30 families. And over the past 23 years, I've observed that as people have started to rely on the internet, the conversation ends, people are scheduling events now on Facebook where it's, it's just very different. There's no more conversation. People don't talk anymore. They don't get together anymore. They don't communicate. And so I'm wondering, and texting is the worst. My kids, I was, um, one of my kids started going to a small Chesterton Academy in Peoria. And I said, the one concern I've heard as a parent is that there's not much social interaction with the kids. And one of the moms was sitting there, oh no, she said, my kids are on Snapchat all the time. I said, yeah. I'm sorry, but that's not a relationship. Okay, so, that, so, so that's the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, can you just introduce you. yourself? And others do the same. I'd love to get to know you all. I'm Kate Smart. Um, I'm just a mom. I'm Great, well, welcome. I'm so, gl I'm so glad you're here. Um, social media, where to begin? Won't even try to address all that, but to me, the most important insight that I've, I've come across is I called up Jonathan Haidt, who as you can tell has been a big source of inspiration um, and a big influence on my own thinking, and said, so Jonathan and John, what's the deal with the social media? These were supposed to connect us into virtual communities, which were supposed to empower us and make us feel good about our lives. And he said, no, that is a complete misunderstanding. What's happening on social media is not connection, it's not communication, it's display. I said, what do you mean? He said, display is what occurs when you show your in-group that you are a loyal member of the team and opposed to the out-group. Another way to think about display would be painting our faces, standing on a hilltop, yelling and shaking our spear at the people standing on the opposite hilltop doing the same at us. So it turns out that's what social media are optimized for, and then of course you all know the problems with virality and algorithms that then select for outrage um, and propagate it. And we also know that there are a lot of important financial incentives to do that. So I don't have an answer to that. I've been in a room with Mark Zuckerberg uh, where he's talked to people far smarter than me about how to deal with this. I can tell you that there's a deep sense of disillusionment in Silicon Valley over what's happened. Um, so-called network sociologists, turns out there's a specialty of people who think about this stuff, 
apparently network sociologists have said from the beginning, they've studied this stuff, they said the way these networks work will be display, it won't be communication. Now we're all stuck with dealing with how do you, what do you do with these platforms that we've already created that, that everyone's on? I wish, I wish I had an answer. Um, I think it's going to involve some of what Facebook is trying to do, which is to try to begin instilling some community rules. Some sense that this is a little bit more like an institution, a little le less like a platform. But I'm here today to understand better how to, how to deal with this stuff. My name is Corbin Witt. I'm a student here, a junior, uh, with a minor in oh, welcome. Uh, Are you from here? I'm actually from Montana. Oh. Yes. Uh, ASU tempted me down with a scholarship offer. Um, ASU is a tempting place. Yes. Oh. Um, my cousin goes here. Oh, nice. Um, my question uh, is related to your Star Trek analogy. It has me thinking uh, specifically about who benefits from our current state. You know, this polarization, it seems from your argument that it doesn't benefit the usual suspects of, you know, major parties or, you know, previous organizations that exerted a lot of control like the church. It seems to benefit someone else. So maybe could you help answer at least offer some conjecture as to what type of person, what group benefits from this increasing polarization? What a great question. A lot of people benefit from it. I'd, I'd welcome comments, by the way, from others in the room. I'm, I, I'd, if possible, it would be good for this not to be just a Q&A, but a, a, a broader discussion. Um, so tribalism polarization turns out to be a really good business model for a number of people. One is a certain type of media establishment, which predominates on the right, which has its own separate media network now. It turns out outrage is an easy button to press and very, uh, something else I learned from Haidt, outrage is an attractor, not a repellent. It's something we rush to. We want to show our group that we're responding appropriately to the outrage. Um, so it turns out that that's something that um, uh, tribal media, predominantly conservative media, have become very good at and have monetized in an enormously successful way. Uh, but Rush Limbaugh started that 30 years ago. Those people are making a lot of money off of tribalism. The second group that it empowers is demagogues. And that's been true down throughout history. It's true in America and Europe and many other places today. Um, the founders took a great deal of care to put in place systems that would stymie demagogues who would press that button. The founders were, f in many ways, very sophisticated psychologists, much more so than most of us are today. They understood that democracies were inherently unstable, that these tribal and demagogic buttons could and would be pushed. They dealt with this in their own day. A sociopathic demagogue named Aaron Burr, who was vice president of the United States, got very close to the top job. So they put in a lot of barriers to try to, try to stop it. I believe in the past 40 or so years, we Americans have dismantled a lot of those barriers in the name of democratization. That opens the path for people like Donald Trump and other demagogues to go back to pressing these buttons as they have since the beginning of history. So they benefit as well. And finally, well, there are lots of groups that benefit. This is also a pretty good business model for activists. If you wanna get people involved, if you wanna get donations, if you wanna solicit support, there is nothing better to do than to send out a blast email. I get these all the time from different groups saying, you're in danger, your way of life is threatened. This is the election that will destroy everything you know and care about. Here's how to fight it, send us money. What we're reckoning with here, I've, I've said this to people, other people who write about it, you know, we often talked as if the decay of our institutions was inevitable or it just happened or it was the result of technology or it was an unfortunate byproduct of positive social change like you know, feminism and gay rights, which I'm a great beneficiary. Those things are true to some extent, but I constantly try to emphasize to those people, this was not primarily a suicide of our institutions, nor was it primarily an accident. To a very large extent, this was murder. There have been groups and coalitions who have spent the last 40 years profiting handsomely off their attacks on institutions. By profiting, I don't necessarily mean money. A lot of it's ideological. They get support for a cause. They make social change, whatever they believe in. But 
a lot of this has been done quite intentionally, often by well-intentioned people. But that's part of the reason why I think with intentionality, we have a shot at turning some of it around. Hi, um, thank you very much for coming to speak thank you. here. Um, my name is Aaron Crust. I'm a student here at ASU. Fantastic, uh, where are you from? Uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, so my question relates to um, something that you were just talking about actually. So one of the things about institutions and these sorts of power structures is that they do tend to uh, kind of perpetuate and help keep in place any kind of like power imbalances and uh, inequalities that we have in our society. So how can we go about um, strengthening these institutions without returning to marginalization? Um, great question, one that comes up all the time. So yeah, there's this narrative that's developed um, in the past 40, 50 years that institutions are obstacles to social change and fairness and reform, that they're seen as distant hierarchies that freeze in place unfair relationships. Well, that's sometimes true, but it's very often not true. I'll bet you didn't know that Tammany Hall the political machine of the Irish and largely Irish in New York in the turn of 20th century America was reviled by the progressives and eventually largely exiled by the progressives, not because it was shutting out minorities, but because it was bringing in, it would go to the docks and organize all the immigrants, the unwashed, uneducated masses that were coming in and say, come into politics, uh, we'll give you food, we'll give you jobs, and by the way, we'll tell you how to vote. It was training people in politics and bringing in all of these, these, um, these unwashed masses. The progressives were horrified by that. They, in fact, in New York State, they actually tried to strip um, lower class Irish of the right to vote. So institutions in many cases seek to be inclusive because they want to grow, they want to expand. I give you, as an example, Arizona State University, a medium-sized backwater university when I grew up here in the 60s and 70s, primarily known for a dormitory establishment up the road here, which we called Sin City. Less said about that, the better. I mean, look at ASU now. Institutions like to build, they like to grow, and that often means bringing new people in. If you think about the roles that the black churches have played in gay rights, that today a lot of corporations and companies are playing um, in gay equality, They've been on the cutting edge. Institutions, the point is, can be on either side of social change, and they always are. But when you don't have them, you don't get directed social change at all. You get atomization. I think this might be the last question. Hello, my name is Ilana. Hi. I'm a senior here at ASU, double majoring in philosophy and schedule. And thank you very much for coming out here. Philosophy and, oh. Sk and schedule, it's yeah. just much easier That's to say That's our acronym. Than the full name. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I wanted to talk and about. And where are you from? Oh, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Yay, a local, sort so, of. So yes, sort of a local. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk about something that you mentioned, which is to reject compromise is to reject government. And in our modern day society, when we have such easy access to things like Amazon or um, social media in which we can have gratification, we don't need to compromise very much in our day-to-day -day life. If we want something very specific, we are able to obtain that. And mm -hmm. so how do we try to renorm society to bring a term that you mentioned and teach our future generations how to compromise? Well, I wish I had a pat answer to that question, but for me, my personal answer to that is that's why I'm here today. Um, to talk about that, to think about that. I hope you can stay for more of this session. The group that ASU has brought together under one roof for this conference is absolutely extraordinary. It includes many of the world's leading thinkers on that very question. Um, and and I, I guess since we're at the end, I can get away with this, but I'm gonna kind of punt that and say that the best answer I can think of that, to that question is, first of all, keep asking it, and second of all, stick around for the rest of the day. Thank you all very much.